So uh, I'm going to say a few words about what we're doing in terms of Erlang programming at uh, Cisco. Um, so most of the Erlang programming that goes on, on on Cisco originates from a company that Cisco bought about four years ago called Talef that has been developing a product, or, or actually a couple of products, um, since to late 2005. Um, geared around network automation and device configuration. Um, a small company, around 100 people, with a small core engineering team that is still kept intact, more or less. It's around 30 um, brilliant engineers. Uh, but there are, of course, uh, around the product, a lot of other engineering activities going on. And most of the development is done in Stockholm with some in Schleftia and and also in San Jose. But that's mostly the activities around the, the core product. Um, we have two two main products, Confti and NSO, uh, that are used by Cisco but also outside Cisco. Um, and this this group is largely kept intact at Cisco as a sort of a, a unit inside Cisco. So what what has the impact been in terms of um, for for the well for for Cisco? What what is Erlang used for? Um, what impact does it have? One, uh, Cisco is now shipping around the two million devices. Is my guesstimate. Uh, yearly with Erlang in them, uh, ranging from all sort of sorts of devices, from switches, routers to to a whole whole bunch of different devices. Uh, not every device, but but quite a few, and um, and it has a significant impact on the bottom line. So we don't want to to uh, mess that up. Our customers that use these products. Uh, tell us that about 90% of all internet traffic goes through uh, nodes controlled by, in effect, Erlang code, uh, since they're using our products. Um, the eight top service providers use Erlang to control the networks through our products. And all in all, I think there are more than 100 uh, service providers that use um, in effect, Erlang code to control the networks to some extent. The top eight network equipment providers use our product and in effect Erlang to control their devices or, or to use in their devices. Um, and I think there are more than 100, 125 uh, equipment providers that use uh, this product in in for doing configuration management. And since we were acquired by Cisco, there has been a growing community of Erlang programmer, um, programmers at Cisco. It's not primarily the case that they are working inside the product, but they are finding Erlang um, an interesting, that's an interesting language to use since I guess they get inspired inspired by by what we're doing, but also to better interface with our products. They they started to develop their own things in Erlang or part of their applications in Erlang. So what are these uh, things that we are building? The first product that we built that sort of originated the whole thing is called ConfD, and the aim the the aim of both our products or actually to open up the network for automation or for programmers to to start doing things with the devices in the network through programming. The sad state of art is that when uh, a network is changed, what's usually happening is that someone creates a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet, gives it to a technician who goes to the device, logs into the device, and, and run a bunch of CLI commands. 
that is basically the state of the art, which is very sad and and, <laughs> and it's not really scalable. So when the size of the networks grows, um, this really becomes a problem. And to make this sort of sort of trying to 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 make the situation better, we created this Confty product, where you feed in a data model that describes exactly what can be configured on a device uh, using a language called Yang that was developed partly by us uh, and standardized in, in ITF as an RFC 6020. Given that specification of what exa exactly what can be configured on a device, which data types each part has, we automatically generate a database schema, all the northbound interfaces from that. And that includes a CLI, a web UI, programmatic interfaces for C and Python and, and, uh, and Java, uh, and also a netconf interface. And netconf is a fairly new standard for configuring devices that allows um, some kind of configuration unit entity to do two-phase transaction towards a device. Um, now, the, the state of the art in, in terms of how to do device management, say you are creating a router or a switch or some, some network device, used to be that you did what was sort of interesting in, in your device from the point of view of adding new functionality. Maybe you had a really nice forwarding plane algorithm that you wanted to push to the customers. And then you added management as, as an afterthought. Maybe you started out with a basic CLI and then the customer said, I want SNMP, and you added a stack with SNMP functionality. And eventually they said, we want a web UI, and you added a web UI with some functionality. But there was a huge feature creep between the different northbounds. Um, and that doesn't really work if you want to do automated configuration. First of all, uh, SNMP is a really poor interface for doing automated configuration, and, uh, and, and CLI is even worse. But, but what, what has been going on is the, the automation that people have been doing has been through screen scraping CLI commands. Uh, so we, we created this product that basically lets a builder of, of, of a device feed in a, a specification of what can be configured, and we auto-render everything. Um, Uh, and it's primarily used for physical virtual devices, switches, routers, space station, smart grid nodes, where customers are using it for satellite systems, for all sorts of things. But, but our main target, the market that we've been targeting with this, is, is internet equipment providers. Um, one requirement is that it needs to be a small footprint daemon. Uh, since we are, our customers are running this on everything from very small devices, small uh, Wi-Fi base stations, up to large um, rack-based systems. And, and that's where Erlang fits in really well. Um, so we, we, we push it down to around 10 megabytes, sort of a base uh, size. And, and to be fair, when we started this project sometime in late 2005, uh, we had been building these kind of systems for uh, Nortel and Ericsson, and, uh, or we had been building device configuration systems, I'd say. And we realized that there was an, an, an opening for building something that could be more um, generally applicable to any kind of device. But uh, we were also looking for an application that would be well suited for Erlang because we wanted to do Erlang programming. And we wanted to use the competitive advantage that we thought Erlang gave us. And we want so we wanted to find an application that where we could sort of utilize that advantage that Erlang gave us. And it and it has been really well suited for that. And one of the one of the reasons is that uh, memory footprint is small. Uh, it's fairly efficient when it comes to High-level language execution. Um, we, it, it, the programs are small, uh, both when, when executed, but also uh, on disk. And as I said, what we do is we generate the database schemas. We generate the CLIs, a couple of different flavors. 
REST, net, REST conf, net conf, SNMP, JSON, RPC, uh, and, and whatever new northbound interfaces that becomes popular, right? Since we are deri deriving it from the data model that the customer feeds into it, uh, there is very little work for the customer to just enable another northbound interface. We have to implement it, but then it, it, it can be used by everyone using the product. And we have some uh, language APIs. Initially, we didn't even say that the product was implemented in Erlang. We just said this is a daemon. You have C, Java, and Python APIs. Um, and and uh, after a few years, we became less afraid of saying that it was actually Erlang. But initially, people were quite reluctant to take on something that had a virtual machine on their small physical hardware. So we didn't say anything, and yeah, they were just happy anyway. So what are the, 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 the key components? I think one really key component for making, making the product successful is the, the built-in database that is geared towards configuration. We are not using Mnesia, uh, even though the originator of Mnesia was working with the company for from the start. Uh, but it wasn't it, it's not the, the the problem we're trying to solve isn't really well suited for Mnesia. It's a tree based uh, database with where you can add subscriptions at different levels. Uh, what is stored in here is configuration for the managed devices. And they are interested in reading the configuration when they start up, but also getting notified whenever something is changed in their configuration, the, the part of the configuration tree that they're interested in. We, of course, support uh, HA through synchronous, re uh, synchronous replication. Uh, and, and one feature that is really nice that plays well with what Erlang, Erlang represents is automatic database content upgrade. So when the schema is upgraded, um, the content of the database is automatically updated at the same time, which is really nice in production when you come with a new release. Uh, the customer's data automatically gets updated, or configurations. But also during development, when you develop the configuration set for a device, it's really nice to not have to redo everything from start, but you can dynamically load a new data model and it would just uh, convert the data. Um, Transactions, we do, we do transactions differently from what, uh, uh, what you would probably think when you think of a database and transactions. In, in, in this product, transactions are, are really a first-class citizen. citizen we the manager objects are able to hook into the transaction and inspect the, the diff sets and do validation and do all sorts of things on the diff set. So uh, the transaction is really a key part of the whole product and, and much much hangs around that. So, so integrating the database and the transaction set really makes sense for this. And the actual data storage can, can be anything. We have our own small um, C program for storing data, but uh, it's fairly easy to hook in any, any kind of database for doing that. But the, but the transaction as such is, is handled by the system. So that, that was the product that, that deals with on-device configuration management. The really interesting part is, as a product called NSO, that is used for controlling configuration in entire networks of devices. And is, this is what is used by service providers or, or large corporations to manage the switches and routers and DNS servers or whatever kind of services they have that is, that is part of the infrastructure of the network in the company. So currently, as I said, the, the state of the art is to do screen scraping through, usually through Python scripts that logs on to a device, issues a bunch of CLI commands, and then uh, logs out. And either that or you, the, an engineer gets an Excel spreadsheet uh, and has to go to some, log on to some device and do some configuration. And the problem with that is that it's not really, it's not under, under Programmatic, programmatic control, so it's it's slow, it's uh, error prone, and you don't know what you what kind of configuration you have on the device. Uh, if you have a, a person doing it, 
they don't remember. They don't remember what was on there originally, and uh, it, you don't really have keep track of what the person did. So when when you add the new customer, it's fairly easy to to make sure that everything works. But when the customer disappears, you really want to remove the configuration from all the devices in the network that you had to touch in order to enable that customer to get the service. So what this uh, was what this um, product does is keeping track of configuration of all all devices in the network, but also all changes and and how they are. Uh, implemented in a network. And uh, similar to ConfD, it takes a data model that exactly describes what can be done on every device, which is really, really important. It gives you basically a struct, a huge struct, or a type specification of what can be done on every device in your network. So that means that if you have that and you have a generic API to all your transactions that you want to do across those devices. You have a single point where your program can hook up, traverse a data structure and do operations on it, and then say, push these changes into the network. You have a really nice point where you can program towards your devices. Um, and, f uh, and this is a bit scary for network engineers uh, and, and a lot of operational, a lot of the operational organizations Managing networks aren't really set up for this, but if they hire engineers, pro software engineers, they really see the power of doing this. It's it's like programming towards a database, where you can you have a clear, clearly defined API, you have uh, transactions, so you can do a bunch of modifications and then push them, and they will either all go through, all the changes will will take effect on the devices, or none will happen. Uh, and we, we have support for building abstractions. So you, what we expose northbound is either the raw configuration of all the devices, but in a uniform normalized format in this data structure. Or we can put abstraction layers saying that we have what we call a service, say a VPN service that takes all the input parameters needed for just VPN. It could be the VPN, the VLAN number, which devices should be involved in that VLA, uh, VPN. And then uh, the customer writes mapping logic that maps that input parameters into device configuration. And, and that can be done in a generic way. So that means that what we expose northbound is not the raw device configuration, but rather the this abstraction layer of creating a VPN. And you can have stacked abstractions. So you can have one abstraction that sort of make use of, an, of, an, of another existing abstraction in the, in the system. Um, and NSO keeps track of, of everything that goes on. So we, since we have these transactions as first class citizens, we can see exactly what is created, what is modified, and what is deleted in each operation and we keep track of that, so it can be undone. So, for example, when a customer comes, a new customer comes in, and the customer created a VPN for that customer, we keep track of exactly what was done on each device. Um, so when the customer disappears, we can remove that configuration, exactly that configuration that was created in the network. And that is really, really key. It sounds like fairly basic kind of operational behavior if you're a programmer, but when it comes to network operators, this is really, really advanced stuff. Um. Also, we don't just talk to NetConf devices. We started out like that, but uh, we really talk to all kinds of devices. So we do the CLI interaction between NSO and whatever device we have, if it's CLI device or if it's could be a, a service, it could be an, an, an Apache server or whatever. We, we, the data model is created to, to describe what can be configured on that device. And then uh, there is a mapping layer that uh, does the actual translation from abstract configuration into device configuration. Um, one of the key things we aim for is to have, to provide a simple 
programming model for the end user, the user of this NSO product. We want the programming model to be simple. What is really happening is distributed uh, transaction across large, potentially large number of devices with synchronization, uh, in both between each transaction, but also inside each change. And this is really hard to, to orchestrate if you, it's basically programming a distributed um, database. And we don't want to expose that to the end users. So we, we really tried to create a simple API for our users so they can operate on what, what they see as a database. They can do commits. And once the commit is successful, they know that it has been pushed to devices. Um, one, sh one difference from Confti is that in this case we have fairly large data. It's not large compared to, say, Facebook or something like that, but it's, it's large, much larger than what you get in a single device. Here we are trying to keep the configuration for maybe 100,000 devices in the in-memory database. So also here, we make use of the fact that Erlang is, is pretty space efficient. So we can actually store 100,000, more than 100,000 configuration, device configurations in memory in our database. Uh, but as networks grow, we, we, we have to be able to scale. So we have created a mechanism for, for uh, creating trees of NSO nodes. And, uh, and um, as the requirement for higher transaction throughput grows, we have moved into eventual consistency uh, setup. So it uh, tends to be the, the usual um, evol evolution of, of databases. We don't, we don't want in to move into full eventual consistency, but we, we do some, some of that. Um, we do integration with custom code. And not we, do, we don't typically expose Erlang to them, so we have a loopback interface where we provide uh, interface libraries. We do have some customers running Erlang code inside our node, which is a bit dangerous, uh, but, but sometimes for efficiency. Uh, and we we're also thinking about uh, opening up the NIF, open up for customers to install their own NIFs in, in our node just to make the communication more efficient. In many cases, a loopback interface is, is completely fine. So how do we use Erlang? Uh, about 95% of the functionality is coded in Erlang. We, we actually use it for, for basically everything, uh, just as, as uh, what up mentioned in, in the other presentation. We, uh, there are very, very few cases where we don't use Erlang. We have about 650,000 lines of Erlang code. Uh, not counting testing. And um, some C codes, C code is of course much more verbose, and most of it uh, are in the interface libraries that we give to other customers. Some term storage and some, um, some lexing and parsing is done in, in C. We have some Java code, which is also just for interfacing with customers. So when we, when we built this NSO product, we thought we'd our end customers would typically be using Java. It turns out that they are actually much more keen on, on Python. Um, so we now have a Python interface as well. Uh, we do some JavaScript in the web UI and um, we have split up the, the system into about 30 applications. Uh, so things like database, Yang compiler, CLI, web UI, and whatnot. Um, as I said, we use it for it for everything for the for the Yang compiler, which is I think open source. Uh, the CLI database implementation, transaction engine, Erlang is really really uh, well suited for these kind of tasks. Uh, this product is not typically in the in the traffic flow. We don't shuffle packets, but we do just configuration changes, and it could be sort of kind of in the, in the flow of an application. So if there is a portal where people order things, it will eventually boil down to some request to, to this product. Um, but it's 
typically not, uh, not processing traffic as such. Um, we hardly use any OTP applications. We use some libraries. I think we use three or four OTP applications. Um, as I said, we don't use Manisha. We don't use distributed Erlang, even though uh, also that guy worked for us who invented distributed Erlang. Um, and we are fairly slow at adopting new adopting new uh, features, language features like maps and things like that. And the reason is that the software that we create have to be supported for five years. So when, when Cisco or for when other equipment providers push their software on the devices, they, they have to support it for, for a very long time. So when we do bug fixes, we don't want to end up in a situation where we are using some feature in, in a later release of our line that we can't backport easily. easily so. and we only use new features like maps for, for things that we, we know we're not going to backport to, or that we don't even support in early release of, of the software. Uh, and um, as a comparison, we have actually made a couple of attempts to, to use other languages. We uh, got requests for implementing the netconf stack in C. So we did that and we, we created really what we thought was a really beautiful C implementation for protocol processing. Uh, but it was just too much work. We spent a year on it. We built an, an initial uh, product, but it was... It, it lacked so many features, and, and the, the, the job to keep it up to date was just, just too much. It wasn't worth the effort. And then we had already implemented NetConf many times before, so we had a very good idea how to structure it, but that didn't really help. And we also, when we did the first NSO implementation, we, uh, we, since we thought our customers were Java shops and didn't want to run another VM on their systems, we we decided to build it in Java. And we spent six months on it and uh, decided that now it can't be done. <laughs> we, we, we're not going to build this product. So we just uh, killed the project and uh, said we, we're, we're not going to build this. And then after an additional six months, we uh, decided to give it another try using Erlang instead and, say that the, and said that the customers can think what they think, but, but we're going to use Erlang for this. And, and then uh, we were successful. So that that's uh, sort of a s wh where we are at Cisco. Okay. Hi, thank you, Johan. 